That's pretty much what Jesus was saying. You know, he was just saying, you know, I'm the son of God, but so are you. <laughs> and that's the whole basis of his teachings. I'm actually, I have this book right here that I'm reading. It's the Yoga of Jesus, which is by Yogananda. It's, it's a great book. And it's a... Uh, it's all about that. It's, it's just interpreting his words in a different way. And it's the whole basis of what we're talking about right now. It's just that, you know, we are, we are, yes, we are, we are a part of God. We're not all of the process. Just because we're part of the process doesn't mean we are all of the process. But the part that we are, we have to take responsibility for. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. That's yeah. Great, so man. love your neighbor as yourself because your neighbor actually is yourself and also it doesn't mean the solipsistic take that some people then develop is oh well then everybody else is just a projection of my mind and that's not true yeah. that because we are inhabiting different physical vehicles that physical differences are real they're not illusory they're not imaginary that mm -hmm. you have a different body than i have and therefore you have a completely different life history than I have. Now at the core, we are the same being. We are two different versions of the same being interacting with itself, but it's interacting through two different characters in the same way that when we're watching a movie and there's five different characters on the screen, there's five different characters on the screen. Right now we have two different characters on the screen. Mm -hmm. It's the same actor playing those parts, but we live through the character. Yes. And that I, I will be in the Martin character until the day I die. And then the Martin character is gone. Just, <laughs> whoop, it just doesn't exist anymore. And you're going to live through your character. You're going to live through the Gary character until the day you die. And then whoop, the Gary character is gone because the vehicle is gone. And then, you know, certain iterations of the Gary character might live on. Like this is going to be on the internet. Who knows how long the internet will exist, but I'm sure that, you know, the interviews that we've done, will continue to exist on the internet after we're dead and gone. And so aspects of the character will still remain. And then people will have ideas and impressions and internalize aspects of the character. So it's, it's more than just the individual that we are, but the only, we, we're not responsible for the rest of that. You know, like an example is a lot of people have really internalized me at this point. Um, you know, I've been, doing interviews for years. I've been doing my podcast for years. I've been writing books for years. And so every once in a while, I'll get an email from someone saying, man, I was on a psychedelic trip last night and you showed up and you were kind of giving me the same instructions that I've heard you say in interviews and you're giving me guidance. And they want to know, they ask me like, so um, what were you doing at like midnight last night? And I just tell them, well, look, I was asleep. And it's like, no, no, you were really there. And I have to tell them, no, that that's your internalized projection of me, that that's, I am not personally involved in that in any way. That is, that is your projection. So we all live with projections of other people um, all the time. Like we, we have projections of who we think our parents are or who we think our significant others are or our enemies and our friends, you know, mm -hmm. so we live at these projections, but the projections are different than the actual person themselves. And so it's, I definitely do not promote a solipsistic view of like, well, everyone's just a figment of my imagination, but no, it, it doesn't work that way. And I, I always like to emphasize that reality is real. And that's another place where, you know, in, in certain non-dual Buddhist and Hindu teachings, they always describe reality as Maya, as an illusion. And I always like to say, well, it's an illusion, but it's still real. So don't think that just because it's not what we think it is doesn't mean that it's not there because energy is real. Mm -hmm. Transformations of energy is real. And that's what reality is made out of is, is energy. Um, it might not be what we think it is. It might not be what we project it as, but it, it's still real. So yeah. we are real different individuals, <laughs> but again, at core, there's only one actor who's playing all the parts simultaneously. Yeah. And, so that, and that's who we really are. Yes. Just, you have to just realize that's just part of the game. That's just the game of life. It, we're, we're, that's kind of why we're here. We, we, are, we are the one expressing itself in a multitude of ways. And that's just life. I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't know. Maybe it's just for fun, but yeah, we are just, the one singular consciousness we are just infinite consciousness 
expressing itself. For what reason? I don't know. Are we growing into this collective being that's unified yet also separate? And, and then from there, we evolve into another state of consciousness. That's what it seems like to me sometimes, but I don't know, man. <laughs> yeah, I would say that's that's the potential. But I do think that you've really tapped into the ultimate answer, you know, like, well, why is there a reality? Why is there something versus nothing? Yeah. And for me, the answer really is that because just being in the unitary state all the time where everything is the same thing and it's all just one, that ultimately that gets infinitely boring. And that we are dealing with an infinite intelligence here. And an infinite intelligence is going to need an infinite project of infinite complexity to keep it occupied because that is the nature of intelligence. Um, and so that is then played out that I like to refer to reality as the reality game. That this is, this one being is playing a game with itself. And that it is very interested to see what what can grow, what can develop, what can evolve over time. And that there's no requirement built into reality for any particular individual to wake up to the fact that, oh, I am that. But the potential is there. And since the potential is there, it does mean that there's the potential for human beings to evolve into different states of relationship, to different states of social organization, and then potentially into different kinds of beings than what we have been. Um, but it's not that there is a necessary end goal to reality because it's just, when it comes down to it, the best we can say, like, look, reality is just what God is doing because it doesn't really have anything else to do. So that's what it's doing. And it's not that there is a particular purpose to it other than, again, I think it's infinitely boring to be in an infinitely unitary state for an infinite amount of time. And it's much more fun if you can divide yourself into relatively discrete individuals and then interact with yourself. That's more fun than being infinitely alone forever with nothing that exists, yes. you know, so that reality is God's way of compensating for the fact that it's the only thing that exists. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a kind of harrowing thought to you know, that it's, I've had people tell me that before. They're like, oh, it's scary, man. Like that. I'm the only thing Like, you know, I've had people, it was actually some guy that did DMT and he was talking to me and he said, yo, man, like I got really scared knowing that like I'm alone. I'm the, like, I'm the only thing. And I was like, yeah, we're alone, but we're alone together. If that makes sense. <laughs> like, like we, I guess we, we are, we are one thing, but we're also not at the same time. And that's the beauty of life. I think that's what just like just that idea to me is a beautiful thing like yes we are alone but not but also not at the same time you know that's just that's just part of the game and i don't know he just got like really he internalized that like that loneliness we just talked about and you know, yeah so. well that's that's another one of the ways that the ego tries to come to terms with this reality. So, you know, we've already talked about that there's there's the solipsistic view, like, oh, everybody's just a figment of my imagination and a projection, or there's the messianic view, oh, I really am the one, so it's all about me. And then there's also the, the overcompensation of, oh, crap, I'm responsible for everything because it's me. And then there's also this potentially terrifying sense of loneliness that can arise from that. It's like, oh my God, I'm the only thing that exists. I'm the only one that exists. And that's still the ego contemplating the non-dual reality because mm -hmm. what the ego is then forgetting is like, oh wait, but I'm still inhabiting my personal meat suit and I still have my dog and there's still my mm -hmm. cat and there's still my neighbors. And so, yeah, there really is only one, but there's also billions of other people here who are also part of this oneness at the same time. Yeah. So, yeah, at the deepest existential level, we are completely alone, but at the practical level, we're not. And mm -hmm. it's never going to be that way. So, again, it's it's the balance between the two. It's yeah. it, what the difficulty is when someone spills so far over into one or the other, then they're no longer living in balance. And and this has also been my critique of the meditation and monastic traditions is that there 
they really do seem to be promoting this idea of, well, reality is all an illusion. So you want to transcend it. And the way you're transcendent is actually by spending the rest of your life meditating and engaging in life as little as possible. And don't ever get married and don't have sex and don't have kids and don't have a job. You know, you've just got to, you just got to meditate and be a monk or a nun. And that seems to be an avoidance of kind of the messiness of the interrelated nature of reality. Now, it's you know perhaps necessary to help people achieve that non-dual state through the meditation process because it's long, it's slow, it's arduous, it's not particularly effective, you know, especially when compared to something like psychedelics or 5-MeO DMT in particular. Um, but it does also promote sort of a, a disassociation from reality, I think. Yeah. Um, which is one of the reasons that I like psychedelics is that you can provide access to these deep states of self-realization, but you do not need to dedicate your life to it. You, you can, it's ironic. You can actually do it on the weekend and then you can go back to your regular life. And then at that point you might realize like, wow, why am I working this job? Why am I in this relationship? What am I doing to myself? I'm not being true to myself. And then, so you might make some big changes, but I'm really interested in helping people be fully realized into the full non-dual nature of the self. And then also, again, take responsibility for who they are as an individual so that then they can live the fullest life as themselves, free from their internal critic and internal judge that we have absorbed from our society, our parents, our religion, our spirituality, our economic status, you know, all of mm -hmm. that stuff that we've internalized that tell us whether we're good or bad or right or wrong. So for me, it really is about this process of helping people liberate themselves. But it's not so that you can liberate and ascend to the highest realms of the astral plane and check out of reality. It's actually, it's liberating so that you can just be here and then be yourself and then live a fulfilling and meaningful life from that place.